Hey, Vibrant. My name is Drew. Everybody say, hey, Drew. If you're online, throw a hey Drew in the chat. We want to say welcome to our York Haven campus joining us today. Good to be with y'all. Uh, welcome to those worshiping online and on site. Woo, we've got a great turnout today. It's going to be a really good day. So glad that y'all have joined us. I know you're going to walk out with a little more encouragement and hope than when you started. Uh, happy Valentine's Day to you. Um, I, I hope today's a good day for you. I know for, uh, for some, it's kind of a difficult day. It's a, a reminder of a loss or a reminder of a broken relationship. And I want you to know that we love you, uh, that we see you, and uh, uh, we're praying with you that God would continue to heal what's been broken in your life. I, uh, I wasn't really interested in relationships until I saw her. Her green eyes cut me to my core. I remember walking onto this basketball court, and there was a, a cute little brunette uh, with some baggy gym shorts on with our rival high school's t-shirt on. And I said, I don't know if, I'm, if we're going to be able to make this work, but boy, I want to. And uh, I met uh, my then girlfriend, Jade, and uh, 15 years old, just a couple of kids here. Everybody say, aww. aww. And, uh, and, and I don't know how I tricked her, but she's still with me today. Praise God. Any men in the room know that you've tricked your wives and you married up? Amen. Yeah, that's me. Uh, I'm okay to own it. <laughs> and, uh, but what's, what's so beautiful about our relationship is that our relationship uh, since that day that we met at church camp uh, when we were 15 years old has not been perfect. We've had ups, we've had downs, we've had downs, and we've had sideways, and we've been all over the map. And if you have navigated relationships in your life, you know that relationships can be difficult. And yet, we still have this idyllic perspective of relationships. We, no matter how much we've been broken, we still pursue and embrace relationships. And some of it could be related to the way that we view relationships. Um, I wanted to share just a couple of my favorite relationships on, on TV via movies and TV shows. Can I share some of those with you? If you recognize the movie or the TV show, why don't you shout it out, okay? Shout it out with me. Here's the first one. Titanic. Once more, you open the door. Uh, classic, right? Classic. I remember going to see this, and uh, it was the first time that I remember a movie theater being sold out, and there were like people sitting like in the aisles. Uh, it was very much not COVID friendly, okay? Uh, but uh, it, yeah, I mean, just the love there, Leo DiCaprio. Yeah, we'll move on. Uh, anybody know this one? Know this one? It's Jerry Maguire. Jerry Maguire, very good. He says, you complete me. And she says, you had me at hello. Oh, all the feels. We'll talk about Jerry Maguire uh, later on in this series. Okay, moving on. Uh, the Office, yeah, yeah, Jim and Pam. Jim and Pam, one of the best TV couples. Very, very good. Love Jim and Pam. And here's this one. Up, oh, you don't even know their names, but you know that you love them. Oh, that opening montage, which is only like maybe five minutes, had me in tears. Only Pixar, I feel like, can do that. But uh, just this beautiful example of what we anticipate relationships are. And we have these idyllic perspectives of what relationships could be. But the reality is often our expectations don't align with our realities, do they? So friends, whether you're single whether you're waiting, whether you're dating, or whether you're mating, there's going to be some helpful handles for you in this series. Now, I'm not talking about those love handles that seem to have found their way to your body as you've spent several months in quarantine. Amen, somebody? Hello. Uh, but I'm talking about just some helpful handles on how to navigate relationships in a God-honoring way. And so wherever you're at with relationships, I know that the series Relationship Goals is going to be encouraging for you. For some, it will be painful because I have mentioned this at the top that it, for some it's a reminder of a loss or a, a broken expectation or a broken miss. But I think regardless of where you're at with relationships, let's embrace this opportunity for a realignment in how we approach relationships, how we view relationships, and what God would have for us in relationships. You know, we have these aspirations and desires, and yet relationships are certainly worth the risk. I love the way that one pastor phrased the risk of relationships. He says this, he says, when it comes to love, we are both the victim and the perpetrator of the crime. Because we are human, we love. But because we love, we bleed. 
Love is the source of our highest highs and lowest lows. Love is joy and laughter and gift and freedom and faith and healing. But when love goes south, it's a knife to the chest. I don't know what kind of issues you may be feeling as love has caused you to bleed. It may be arguments, it may be missed expectations, it may be a disagreement in finances or communications, it may be betrayal, it may be misplaced priorities, or you just may simply feel like you're growing apart. My question that I want to ask is, and this is the first of several weeks, and why don't you just decide today that you're going to commit to joining us, tuning in for all four weeks of this series. It's going to be helpful for all of us. But my question that I wanted to ask today is how do we win at relationships? How do we win in navigating relational dynamics? And to be honest, as I mentioned, introducing uh, my 15-year-old self to my 15-year-old soon-to-be wife, that I've not always won in relationships. And so some of the teaching today is going to be shared out of my own example and experience. But additionally, we're going to just got to dive in here and see what God would have for us in understanding and winning at relationships. Everybody, that sound good? Everybody say yes, Drew. Yes. Cool. Let's do it. Go ahead. And if you've got a Bible or Bible app, go ahead and swipe those open. I think to understand how to win at relationships, we've got to go right back to the beginning, the what or the why of relationships. So go back to Genesis chapter two. And if you're new to the Bible, Genesis is the very first book of the Bible. Genesis literally means beginning. Now, Genesis was written uh, by Moses to the nation of Israel. Now, what's unique about the book of Genesis is we can often treat the book of Genesis almost like a history book, when it was never actually intended to be read as a history book. It was actually written to remind the nation of Israel of the faithfulness and goodness of God. And so if we read it through that context, we'll get the most out of it. And so Genesis chapter 2, we see God in the beginning creating. He's creating. So how do we win at relationships? Let's first understand the relationships, where the source comes from. So Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. He's completed creation. He's got Adam in the garden, okay, the Garden of Eden. Um, and it's just Adam, it's God, and it's creation. And here's where we're at, verse 18. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. Somebody say amen. Amen. It is not good for the man or the woman to be alone. He says, I will make a helpmate or a, a suitable, help, suitable helper for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them and whatever the man called each living creature that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. Now, before I get to this next verse, what's unique about this is it's like, God says it's not good for man to be alone. Why would God choose now to say like, all right, let's name all these animals. I had a hard time understanding that because it's like, that feels like a separate like priority here, separate uh, checklist, right? Uh, it's not good for you to be alone. So let's name these monkeys, right? Like, I don't understand why God would choose now to name the animals, right? But then he says this, like Moses wrote, wrote this. He says, but for Adam, no suitable helper was found. And so I don't know what was going, maybe it was Adam's idea. I can't imagine it was God's idea, but they thought, like Adam thought in his mind, maybe a suitable helper will come from these animals. Like, can you imagine that lineup for a minute? The platypus walks up and it's like, nah, this ain't gonna work, okay? Like he's looking for someone to be like a helpmate, a partner, a co-partner with, a co-mission co partner with. And like at the turtle, like, I don't know, God, if you have a different idea for this, but they were looking for a, a helpmate for Adam because it was not good for man to be alone. So the Lord God, realizing that none of the animals were gonna be suitable, caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then he closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is good. <laughs> That's what the man was thinking, I'm sure. But he says, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Relationships, we see relationships at the beginning. And for God to make a statement that it is not good 
for you and for me to be alone, we see that God has wired us uniquely for relationships. So I'd love to, just at the top, even before we get to this how to win relationships, it's important to understand the significance and the purpose that God has for us in relationships. So just three quick points about relationships. Number one, relationships are God's idea. They're not yours, they were God's idea. They were God's idea to begin with, that you were created to be in relationship. That is the essence of his creation. And going on for relationship being God's idea, to continue on, relationships are God's purpose. That you were created on purpose for this purpose, to be united in relationship with one another. Not simply horizontally with people around you, but also vertically. That we were creatures created for relationship with others around us, but also with God in us, through us. We were created for relationships, that it was his idea and his purpose. Now, if I were to ask you, we asked this question several weeks ago. Now, if you, I, I, we're going to do a little quiz if you've been around. If you've not, grace, okay? Grace upon grace. But we talked about the will of God and what God's will is for the kingdom or for this world. Now, if you remember, it's, a, it's one word. What is God's will for you and for me? Does anybody remember? It starts with an R restoration. God's will for us is restoration. The restoration of every broken thing, of injustice, of pain in our lives. God's purpose in this world is restoration. And what we see right out here in the gate in Genesis chapter 2 is if God's, if relationships are God's idea and they're God's purpose, then we have to deduce two and two together that if his purpose is relationship and it's restoration, then we can discover this together, that God, that relationships are God's God's vehicle for restoration. This is why we need each other. This is why we need the church. If you've ever said this statement that you say, I love Jesus, but I don't love the church. I can understand where that thought and that mindset may come from because I know that many of you have been burned by the church at, at some point in your lives. And friends, when we've got people that are broken, imperfect people, like in things, there's going to be pain. Like that's just part of navigating the imperfection of this world and of this life. But friends, if we do not have relationship uh, horizontally around us, then we are not actually executing God's vehicle for restoration in this world. Because restoration happens, his vehicle is through relationships. And so one of the unique purposes of marriage, and we'll talk about this in a few weeks, but one of the unique purposes of marriage is this, is this outpouring and, and display that you are united as one flesh with one another so that others may see Jesus and restoration may happen in this world. God's purpose and vehicle for relationships is the cause to restoration. It's what God does. And so if anything, if you have given up on people, if you've given up on the church, if you've given up on finding your Valentine or whatever it may be for you, recognize this, that relationships are the key to allowing God's kingdom to come in and through your life. Restoration happens by embracing and navigating all of the mess and the dynamics of relationships around us. And I hope you're piecing two and two together that I'm not simply talking about romantic relationships. I'm talking about friendships. I'm talking about family. I'm talking about church relationships. This is why we need each other. This is why we need the church. This is where we work our faith out together and we grow together in order to be this light on a hill, this salt of the earth, this restoration into the world. And so, my friends, don't give up on relationships. Don't give up on relationships because they're God's vehicle for restoration. Which is, leads us to what makes relationships, uh, romantic relationships, family relationships, family or friendship relationships, church relationships, what makes relationships healthy? How do we win at relationships? You ready? You ready? Go ahead and lean in with me. You ready? It's love. It's love. <sighs> now you may be going, duh. <laughs> duh, are you going to give me a little bit more than that? Like, are you just going to close in prayer and call it a day here? Uh, no, <laughs> no, I'm not. But, but God gives us this understanding that in order to win at relationships, we have to embrace love. See, John, an early follower of Jesus, recognized this and saw this. And in his letter 
to several churches. He wrote this in 1 John chapter 4. He says, dear friends, let us, say this word with me, love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. That last, that last sentence is scary. And I want to read it just one more time to kind of let it sink in. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Now, if if you are wondering what I may be saying and you're like, okay, Drew, like in order to win at relationships, we've got to be connected to God, right? Like everything will be perfect. Uh, that's not totally true. <laughs> that's not totally true. Um, but there's a deeper understanding here in how we understand this word love that John is describing. Even in the way that we use the word love in our culture today. In the same breath, I can say, I love my wife, Jade. And I can also say, I love queso. They're two different types of love, aren't they? Right? Uh, like, I am not marrying queso, okay? But in the same breath, I can say, I love vibrant, and I love the color orange. Like, they, they don't, they're, they're two different types of love here. And so in our English vocabulary, the way that we understand and describe the word love is kind of, kind of, kind of uh, uh, simple, like, it's not necessarily all-encompassing and describing of the type of love that John is after here. See, in order to understand the type of love that John is after here, I think we need to understand, actually, the original language that John wrote it in. Now, the Bible is actually written in a few different languages, if you didn't know this. The Old Testament was primarily written in a language called Hebrew, and then the New Testament was primarily written in a language called Greek. Now, when we see this word love in the New Testament, and even in the Hebrew, but we're just going to talk about the Greek today, there are several different types of love that could be described here. Now, we're going to go to school for a little bit this morning. Y'all ready to go to school? Say, yes, Mr. Drew. All right, here we go. We're going to go to school and let's talk about the different forms of love. So when we see these Greek forms of love, one of the first ones that we see is this word storge. Everybody say storge. Now, storge, an understanding of this, is more of a, a family type of love. It's a, an affection for one another. It's a, uh, uh, as, as one theologian describes, it's kind of the basis. It's an affection and a family type of love. Now, storge is a Greek form of love, but this is not the word that John is using here in 1 John 4, that God is storge. He's not talking about God as storge. Another form of love in the Greek is this word phileia. Everybody say phileia. Pennsylvania friends, this may be where you recognize the word Philadelphia, right? Brotherly love. It's a, a sibling or a friendship type of love, okay? It's when you're uh, near and dear and close to someone else through a friendship. It's a friendship type of love. Now, when John says that uh, we, like God is love, he's not saying God is phileia. Phileia is not the word, but it is certainly a form of love in the Greek. Another form of love here is this word eros. Everybody say eros. Now, this is where we get the word uh, you can understand maybe the word that's derived here, a little PG-13 real quick, erotic. This is where it's talking about a sensual, romantic type of love. This is where we get that word from. Now, eros is simply more than just intimacy with someone else. It's actually this romantic design for one another. That's where we get this, this, this affection. It's, it's feelings and butterflies in your stomach, but also a, a lifelong decision that you make. But when John is writing this word in 1 John 4. He is not saying God is eros. That's not what he's saying. He's actually using a different form of love here in the Greek. And this brings me, there are several different forms of, of, of love in the Greek, but I want to just cover these four. And this, this word, agape. Everybody say agape. Now, agape is a little bit difficult to understand. Agape is more seen than felt. It's more proven and exemplified than understood. And when John is uh, writing that God is love, he's not writing God as storge. He's not writing God as phileia. He's not writing God as eros. He's writing God is agape. This is the word that John is using to describe who God is and the type of love that we need to emulate into the world. A an understanding of agape is agape is selfless. It's self-sacrificing. It's other exalting. It's give up your life for the other kind of love. C.S. Lewis described it as charity. 
It's giving of yourself and not anticipating anything in return. So when you see the New Testament, this word love that's used, you see uh, 1 Corinthians 13, which we just heard recently in our communion, is uh, the greatest of these is love. He says, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. He's saying the greatest of these is agape. This prove it kind of love. John 3, 16, even if you didn't grow up in the church, you know, it's for God so agape the world that he gave his one and only son. That's the word that's used there. For God so agape the world. And in 1 John 4, we see this, John describes, let us agape one another. For God is agape. Now for us to understand what this word agape means, I put together just a few phrases for us to understand what it means to live an agape type of love, to embrace this, this realization of who God is and then what this means for us. Okay, sound good? So here's some of the phrases that we've got. Agape love isn't conditional, it's absolute. Meaning you don't put boundaries on it, you don't put conditions on it, it is absolute. Agape love is absolute. Salute. Agape love doesn't demand reciprocity. It loves no strings attached. It loves no strings attached. It does not expect anything in return, but it loves no strings attached. Agape love is incomplete if it doesn't hit your hands and feet. Amen? That if your love does not actually meet your action, if your words are simply not meeting your hands and feet, then that is not complete love. That is an incomplete form of love. Agape love is incomplete until it meets your hands and feet. And agape love's only agenda is others. Agape love's only agenda is others. So for us to understand in 1 John 4 that John encourages us and implores us to love one another. He's not saying eros one another. He's not saying phileo one another. He's saying agape one another. So friends, let me bring this home for you and for me. This understanding of agape is to give up your life for the other kind of love. And friends, if you want to win at relationships, if you want to win in your marriage, you want to win in your friendships, you want to win in your family, you want to live or win in your workplace and in our church, you have to make agape your love. You have to. You have to make agape your love. And all of those other types of love, you will exercise, and that's a good thing. But if agape is not present, there's a fullness of life and joy that you are missing out on. Because Jesus says, for those who want to save their lives will lose it, but those who want to lose their lives for me will save it. Life is best experienced when we give our lives away, not try to hold it for ourselves. An agape type of love is a type of love that you give yourself away that you choose to invest in the other person. It's self-sacrificing and other exalting. Now, if you and I were sitting down for coffee right now, some of you may push back and say, Drew, I've been burned in relationships. I've been abused in relationships. And now you're telling me that I need to lean in and give up myself in relationships? That leaves me vulnerable. And I think some of us have a reasonable concern about becoming vulnerable in relationships because, you, because you've been abused before. Now, let me be clear. If you are in an abusive relationship, physically, verbally, emotionally, you need to reconsider that relationship. And if you're not sure if that's a relationship you need to step out of, feel free to, to send a note to one of our pastors. We'd be glad to walk alongside of you and to get you into a safe and healthy place. But friends, Agape love has to be our approach and embrace to step into relationships, even if it allows us to be vulnerable. Why? Because love is worth it. Relationships are worth it. I love the way that C.S. Lewis described the danger of love. C.S. Lewis, is, he wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, um, but he was best friends with J.R.R. Tolkien, who wrote The Lord of the Rings. And uh, C.S. Lewis is one of the uh, top theologians of the last several centuries. And he wrote this when it comes to agape love. He said this, he said, to love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give it to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it carefully round with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, 
safe, dark, motionless, airless. It will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. To love is to be vulnerable. Friends, we love because it's worth it. We bleed because it's worth it. We embrace agape to love one another because it's worth it. And what is the perfect picture of agape love? It's Jesus. That even while we were still broken, he chose you. He chose me. And, and expected nothing in return. He simply invites us to come and to place our hope and our trust in Jesus. I'd love to finish up the chapter in 1 John 4, but I would love to just replace the word love with the Greek word of agape, which means to prove it, self, selfless kind of love. This is how God showed his agape among us, his love for us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is agape. Not that we agaped God, not that we loved God, but that he agaped us. And he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so agaped us, we also ought to agape one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we agape one another, God lives in us and his agape is made complete in us. Friends, lean into relationships and embrace agape as your love. And friends, when agape is your decision and when agape meets your hands and your feet, the fullness of life is discovered there. And you will find your joy and your cup running over. Because when we give our lives away, we find it. And so friends, if you've not given your life to Jesus, if you've not said yes to his agape, prove it, example type of love, make today the day. Take a step towards Jesus. If you've never been baptized, we'd love to do that. We'd love to have a conversation with you. Go to livevibrant.com slash Jesus. Let us know how we can walk alongside of you on your journey with Jesus. Friends, let's be people that are not to be defined and described as a, a people that have their hearts locked in a coffin, but let's allow our lives and our hearts to be described as selfless. Prove it. Agape type of love. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for being our agape. <laughs> thank you for loving us and proving it. Not simply allowing your love to settle with words, but to meet your hands and feet. And so God, as we navigate relationships, romantic relationships, friendships, family, church, work, whatever it may be, Lord, may agape be our love. May we allow our lives to be lived in a way that shows that you are God, that you are Lord and Savior of our lives. And may others, in turn, as they see our agape, may they see you and give you all the glory. God, we live in, a, in such a way that we love others selflessly because you loved us selflessly. And so continue to give us a glimpse in the fullness of the way that you love us. May it be so, Lord. May it be so. May it be so. In Jesus' name. And we all said together, 